Thanks, Sui, Lee, and, uh, and uh, the conference organizers for inviting me here today. Um, I, I'm really honored to be here. I've learned a tremendous amount. Part of it's a vision of, I think, uh, the future of biology. And, and a lot of interesting details, like I just learned that my uh, pet starling's going to live for another 10 years. So, <clears throat> and uh, when I, when I uh, agreed to come, I offered two uh, perspective titles. And one is about a topic that is well within my comfort zone right here, uh, which is the cell biology of this very abundant marine uh, uh, plankter. And uh, the other topic was the one that the conference uh, organizers preferred, which is um, predicting uh, long-term impacts of ocean acidification. Now, I think if there was an app that measured speaker stress, that uh, uh, it would notice that when you're talking about other people's data, scientists tend to have a much higher stress level. So that's why I'm up here telling jokes, to not, to calm, not to make you laugh, but to calm myself down a little bit. So but I am delighted to be here, and it is a fascinating topic, and it gave me an opportunity to uh, develop some ideas. Now, this term ocean desertification, uh, not everybody prefers it, but it's a reference to the fact that uh, central ocean regions are becoming uh, 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 less and less productive as a consequence of the depletion of nutrients. And so this, um, this slide illustrates that. It's uh, uh, data from uh, a paper by Berenfeld, and it shows uh, sea, sur sea surface temperatures, which are rising as a consequence of climate change. And it shows net primary productivity, which is observable from space by satellite, uh, which is uh, on the decline in many ocean regions and correlated, uh, well correlated with those rising sea surface temperatures. So what's the mechanism of this process? It's very simple. You have uh, uh, photosynthetic cells being produced in the ocean surface that are uh, <clears throat> capturing minerals and they're sinking out of the euphotic zone into the deep ocean. And so that produces profiles like these for uh, lots and lots of biologically important nutrients. Uh, you have uh, here uh, depth on this axis and kilometers and, uh, and nutrient concentrations, nitrate, phosphate, silicate, important ones, but many other important nutrients that are part of uh, the composition of cells decline as you, uh, as, as you uh, or rise as you drop into the deep ocean and decline as you um, uh, approach the surface as a consequence of this. But the element that matters the most right now uh, is carbon. Everybody's concerned about that. And so uh, this same process results in carbon burial on a massive scale in the ocean. Sometimes this is called the biological carbon pump. And again, it's phytoplankton fixing carbon and that carbon sinking. And for a physicist, I know we have lots of physicists in the, in the room, what determines the rate at which this carbon fluxes out of the ocean surface? Well, it's, it's the size of the particle, the density of the particle, the shape of the particle. Uh, but it's also the composition of the particle and the rate at which that material is recycled uh, as it descends. So that material is being degraded uh, as it drops down into the ocean. And most of it's being recycled back up into the atmosphere. Now, I presented this so far as if it was sort of a static picture of, uh, of ocean desertification and sea surface warming, but it's actually a very dynamic picture, and that's shown in, um, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but it's a lovely graph, and uh, this is SeaWIFS data, so satellite data showing ocean surface chlorophyll. And the reason I'm showing this to you is I'm going to talk about a site which is visible on this, uh, uh, on this chart. And it's right here, Bermuda, located in this part uh, of the oceans. And one, what you're going to notice is that there's tremendous seasonality in, um, in the amount of chlorophyll on the ocean surface at this site. So some parts of the world are almost always green. Other parts are almost always blue, indicating very low chlorophyll. But at this, but at this site, it oscillates. So this gives us an opportunity to study the kinds of changes that happen in the ocean surface as it warms up, because it happens basically every single year. And so we can go there year after year and uh, study the patterns uh, that, that occur. So we've done that for nine years at this site, or at least this is nine years of data I'm going to show you now. So this is 16S 
This is ribosomal RNA amplicon sequencing data. There's a tremendous amount of metaproteomic data and metagenomic data also at this site. But this is, uh, this is the data I'm mostly going to be referring to in the talk. And a, a really broad picture of what's happening on a seasonal basis at this site is illustrated here the, uh, by these two panels, which shows the variation. So this is average data over nine years. Uh, this is month. This is depth zero to 300 meters. Uh, and here we see average data of all the amplicons uh, that, that are from photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms. And here are all the amplicons that are from photosynthetic bacteria. And you see a seasonal transition every year in the winter uh, when the water mixes, uh, nutrients are brought to the surface, and these photosynthetic eukaryotes bloom. They, so they form uh, large populations. Which, which decline greatly as you move into the summer as that water heats and nutrients are lost. So you have cold winters here and big storms bringing nutrients up into the surface and then a loss of that, uh, a loss of that all those nutrients really by that export of, bio uh, of organic matter and, uh, and a transition from a system dominated by small eukaryotic phytoplankton to one dominated by uh, cyanobacteria. Now, this is the coarse view of it, but a finer scale view of the same process is offered here. This is work that we're doing in collaboration with Alex Worden's group of Mbari. And uh, it shows uh, blooms of different species of eukaryotic phytoplankton. And here we see one called Micromonas, a very small eukaryotic phytoplankton. When these sort of technologies were applied to this site, there were a lot of surprises. This was one surprise, that these organisms, which are normally found closer to polar regions, uh, actually bloom here every winter in, in considerable abundance. A second surprise was that these organisms, uh, silicoflagellates, this surprise, by the way, uh, arrived last week. So we just analyzed this data. And uh, this was actually Alex Worden's uh, uh, group's analysis done by uh, uh, Sebastian Sudek. And what you see here is um, the distribution of stromenopile phytoplankton uh, in this bar graph as a function of month throughout the seasons. And so this reflects those seasonal transitions we're seeing uh, in this graph, but in much greater, with much greater resolution. And the big surprise is that these silicoflagellates are very abundant in the summer. Now, this is a highly studied site, and it was really a surprise to see uh, these taxa there. And they're important because they make an opal, essentially an opal basket that they live inside of, and that opal basket makes them dense. And so this may explain why uh, we've been observing a high rate of carbon, or others have observed a high rate of carbon export from this system uh, uh, in the summer months when we didn't expect it. So this data just came in. And, but this is older data. So I'm talking about the factors that control how carbon moves out of the ocean surface. And I, mainly the focus it tends to be on phytoplankton. But my lab group studies the other side of the carbon cycle, those organisms that actually convert organic carbon back into CO2. And in this slide, you see some distributions of, sorry, distributions of some of those taxa. This is an ordination plot of literally thousands of taxa that have been mapped at this site. So you've all seen microbiome research. This is the same kind of approach. Uh, but my group, we tend to focus on uh, specific organisms that we think are important in the system. Here are three of them. And you see that they're very stratified in the water column. This one at the surface in the euphotic zone, although it recycles carbon. This one uh, at, in, a, in a layer deeper in the ocean, uh, this one below that. So these are very important, abundant microbial groups in the ocean. But their function is to take that carbon and turn it back into uh, CO2. So now the question is, how do these changing ocean conditions affect the, the rate at which that carbon is moved out of the ocean surface, carbon but all the other nutrients too, into the deep ocean? And the answer to that is that we don't know. 
So there was a lot of hubris in my title, which was predicting ocean strat consequences of ocean stratification. Um, uh, because really, right now, we can't predict it. But what we can do is begin to uh, identify those things that we don't understand and gather more data about them. And so here's data from two recent papers. Uh, this one uh, from Chris Marse uh, and another over here from um, uh, Lopez uh, that show two contrasting views of what's likely to happen in the future as a consequence of, consequence of ocean warming. Uh, Chris Marse's group based their data on uh, sediment trap data. And what they show is a, an increase in the rate at which carbon is recycled, to, uh, which organic carbon is recycled to CO2 with ocean warming. Uh, whereas this other group uh, predicted a decrease in essentially more efficient. So this is a positive feedback loop on ocean warming. This is a negative feedback loop. And this is our site that I've just been showing you, which conforms to this model over here. And I'm kind of rushing through this. And if we have time for questions, we can come back. Um, but it's essentially the explanation given here for th the shape of these curves is that bacteria respire carbon more efficiently in warmer water. And so that's the basis. This is actual real data, but the explanation for the observations is just a higher rate of respiration. On the other hand, this group, which based their data on sediment trap data, said, no, it's the phytoplankton. It's the heavier phytoplankton formed in this post-glacial period. And here we're moving from glaciation to the present. And <laughs> over that period, greater um, efficiency in carbon burial. So I think that this kind of, uh, these papers both published in 2015, this kind of data shows us that really it's variation in details of how these systems work that is, uh, that is controlling what's happening. And I have this little devil to remind me that it's really the devil and the details that matters when you're trying to in interpret ocean warming. Now I've got about 10 minutes left. And <clears throat> I want to talk about the details for a moment. So many of these organisms that, were, that are found in this ecosystem were once thought of as unculturable, but now they're, they're, now they're organisms we can grow and study in labs. Here's actually a picture of this community we've been talking about, the community that thrives when that ocean becomes very hot, uh, or I should say warm, and, and extremely low in nutrient concentrations. So we can study these organisms in the lab. And here's one particular organism called SAR-11 or Pelagibacter that my group studies. And this is data showing us um, calculations that estimate how much of the carbon that's fixed annually in the oceans is turned back into carbon dioxide by this one group of organisms. And that estimate is 11 to 44% of all the photosynth uh, photosynthesis in the ocean is reconverted to CO2 by this one clade of organisms. So you can see how significant the activity of some of these organisms are. So what's special about these cells, other than the fact that they're obviously tremendously successful? And the answer is quite a few things are, uh, quite a th few things are very different if you're a microbiologist. When you, uh, when you start to study them, you, you uh, have quite a few surprises. And one of them is their genome size. So uh, this is genome size uh, on this axis and percent non-coding DNA on this axis. And these are organisms with very small genomes, but they're all symbionts. And if we look into these ocean systems, we find organisms that have very small genomes, uh, but also have other signatures, other genomic signatures. For example, low percentage of non-coding DNA, and there are others. But clearly, they have gotten to this, these small genome size <laughs> by a very different path from these organisms. Uh, so it's a very, different, uh, a very different evolutionary path. And this is typical of these, these populations or these communities that we find in these very nutrient-limited conditions. So this is estimated uh, genome size from, geno from metagenomic data. And all these, blue, uh, all these blue estimates are from ocean surface populations. And as you move to the parts of the ocean where there's less and less uh, nutrients available, you have um, smaller and smaller average genome sizes. So one of the things we've been doing is trying to understand how this selective pressure to 
to really do things more efficiently and have a smaller genome has affected the metabolism of the cells. And Paul Carini, a graduate student in the laboratory, published this paper recently, which shows one of these adaptations, which is the loss of genes indicated in red for thiamine biosynthesis. Not all the genes, but some of the genes. And it turns out that the bottom line in this story is that these cells have to have a compound I'd never heard of called hydroxy um, uh, methyl methylpyrimidine, which is a precursor for the synthesis of thiamine, which is an essential cofactor. So uh, complete surprise to us that phytoplankton make this compound and that these, that these, uh, uh, these organisms have to have it. You can't give them thiamine. They need this compound or they won't grow. So that was, uh, it was, uh, that's just one example. We know that they have other unusual nutrient requirements that are a consequence of, this, uh, of, uh, of genome reduction. But I want to focus on this one and use it to illustrate an important point, which is when we go to these communities I've been showing you, and we take all of that data and we ask how those communities are organized, what we see are small world networks. Now, we're not the first to see this in plankton communities, but um, uh, I won't, uh, I'll skip the details and say, uh, you know, that, that I think there's agreement that these communities form small world networks and that this is after you take out uh, the effect of seasonality, which causes spurious correlations. Uh, we get that kind of result. And really the question is, to what extent is, uh, it, are these connections controlled by, uh, for example, nutrient, unusual nutrient requirements that are the consequence of genome reduction? And the answer to that is that we can't tell you. We can't tell you what one, single, uh, what one single connection in the network is in a mechanistic way. We simply see mechanisms and we see the network. But connecting the two is something that has been a tremendous challenge. Now, a few more things about <coughs> that we've learned about at least this cell that we hope or we, 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 we speculate will apply to other organisms from this system. Uh, is that their organization of control of their metabolism is very different. For example, we've been studying their conversion of this compound, dimethyl sulfonyl uh, propionate, to these two gases, dimethyl sulfide and uh, methane thiol. So these are two gases that climate scientists are very interested in. And it turns out that they make both, as uh, we see in this data over here. And we now know. Uh, the pathways, by the way, these, one of these pathways was unannotated because it involved novel, uh, uh, novel genes. And um, so it came as a surprise. Both these pathways are, uh, compete for the same substrate in this organism. They are constitutively expressed. The data for that is very clear. They're on all the time. Uh, but the enzymes, uh, the, the first enzyme uh, in both of these uh, pathways uh, uh, these enzymes have different KMs and Vmaxes. So here's a model for how this works. And what we think is going on is that they express this all the time, and it's kinetically regulated so that most of the substrate uh, is converted to methane thiol, which they need as a source of sulfur because they're deficient in genes for the reduction of sulfate. So you see how this system works. And as you raise the concentrations of this critical compound in the environment, I can probably use this, uh, then uh, the second enzyme system is kinetically activated, uh, and we start to see more dimethyl sulfide coming out of the culture. Now, this fits th uh, the things that are important to geochemists in terms of modeling uh, how, uh, how these gases are emitted from the ocean. <coughs> This conclusion that a lot of the regulation in these cells is based on uh, ribose switches, which I'm not going to talk about today, and kinetic regulation, uh, I think I'll make it on time, uh, uh, supports data from network analysis of about 107 uh, AFI microarrays. Um, this is an alpha proteobacterium. Uh, this is a paper about a different alpha proteobacterium, 40 modules in this network in our 107 microarrays. We see seven modules. This is Ben Temperton's work. Not one of these modules is for carbon oxidation. They're all for responding to nutrients that, uh, element, uh, elements that often become limiting in the ocean surface. So carbon oxidation is on all the time. This is probably the world's premier carbon oxidizer. Um, <clears throat> as you move into these very 
low nutrient parts of the ocean. Uh, so these cells are found everywhere in the ocean surface, but there are variation. There is variation between the high and low nutrient parts of the ocean surface. So all of this data I've been showing you is from an extremely low nutrient system. They have different genes when you move into this system, and some of these genes are uh, relevant to understanding what's likely to happen in these ocean gyres as the oceans warm. This set of genes in controls their response to. Um, uh, to phosphate limitation, one of the key limiters. And here was an interesting discovery uh, uh, reported by, uh, again, Paul Carini in my laboratory. It turns out that in these very low nutrient regions, they find phosphate by going to uh, a, a compound, uh, a set of compounds or a group of compounds known as phosphonates, which is a carbon phosphorus bond rather than carbon oxygen phosphorus. And these phosphonates, one, one of those important phosphonates that's important in the ocean surface is methyl phosphonate. And when that compound is degraded by these cells to make phosphorus for growth, uh, it turns out the cells produce methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. So here you have a positive feedback loop between ocean warming uh, and, uh, the, and uh, the abundance or the distribution of a process uh, that contributes to um, rising greenhouse glass, uh, gases. Uh, we're quite sure that this, these genes are turned on in this system because they're, I think, number seven and number eight, respectively, in metaproteomes uh, from this ocean site. So clearly, these are important genes in this ecosystem. <coughs> I was going to tell you about other adaptations that involve changes in the lipid composition of these cells that enable them to lower their requirement for phosphorus by, re, uh, by replacing those lipids with lipids that have been um, uh, decorated with uh, glycosyl groups or amino acids. I think I'll skip that data because I'd, that puts me right on time and gives you a chance to ask questions. Uh, but of course, I do want to thank a huge team of people, uh, many of whom I've not been, uh, some of whom I've mentioned, but many not, uh, especially Craig Carlson, my collaborator, uh, <coughs> and all this, and all the oceanographic part of this research, uh, and uh, the team out at Pacific Northwest National Labs who did a lot of proteomics, and Kevin Verdeen, who uh, was a very important uh, person who, for uh, more than 20 years, worked on this data from uh, the Sargasso Sea. So, I'll stop there and give you a chance to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dustin, first question. You mentioned something in passing, the, the, the gene loss in, in species that form mutualisms. Is there more, do you think there's more, more gene loss in mutualistic species, or do they switch to more non-coding genes? Um, Have you looked? Your graph started to get at it, I thought. But. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a very good question. A, a, a very, I think the answer is very complicated. So. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the Black Queen hypothesis, uh, which says that you know, organisms can decrease their cost of replication, but at the expense of codependency, you might think of. So that's actually a very complicated subject when you look at it from our perspective, because um, you have really two factors. You have the pressure on the cell to have a smaller genome, which is to us appears clearly to be a function of the environment. And those pressures are very high in, in these regions we're studying. So uh, the, secondly, I think cells, <clears throat> these, free, these are free living plankton cells. To, so what extent are they, you know, clearly they're forming networks. To what extent are they codependent? And when we look at how their nutrient requirements have evolved by, you know, essentially comparative metabolism perspective. They're, I think, trying to avoid codependence. But sometimes they don't avoid it. So the hydroxymethyl, the HMP story, I think really fits a black queen model. I think their other nutrient requirements uh, do not. That they have, they've, they've lost a lot of genes, and it creates requirements, but they've diversified their 
avenues by which those requirements can be met. Does that answer your question? It does. OK. I think, I think organisms don't like to be, mostly don't like to be dependent. And if they are, it's because it's an advantage that the trade-offs are, are favorable. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have any background in this area, but did I, am I hearing you say that this genomic change is not epigenetic in turning off genes, but that environmental pressure actually identifies genes to be kicked out of the organism so you reduce the gene count? That is exactly what I'm saying, yeah. Well, what's the mechanism of what's, what's going on? <laughs> That's my usual talk. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be happy to come back. Uh, so the question of what controls genome size in bacteria it, it has a long history. And there, there, so there's a continuous flux of genes into these genomes. That's obvious from, so they, in fact, they have the second highest recombination rate ever observed in bacteria, this group I'm talking about. So there's plenty of genetic material coming into the cell. Uh, but the process that's booting, uh, booting DNA back out of that genome is just very active in these organisms. So it's not, it's not isolation. It's pressure to reduce genome size. Uh, uh, and so usually that's, in the literature, you'll find the term deletional bias. So cells just tend to delete, bacterial cells tend to delete part of their genome randomly. And that creates a pressure that, you know, cleans, cleans the garage. In these cells, it appears to be selection such that if there are two competing cells and one has a slightly bigger genome, the one with the bigger genome is at a disadvantage because it requires more of these essential nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, to replicate. That is what we think, in a nutshell, the mechanism is. So I suppose going on that point, if, if these uh, sets of genes are being kicked out, that's going to be almost a fatal decision for that community to go through because unless you've got some other mechanism where they're, they're actually um, having gain of genes coming through from other um, organisms to try and recover from that. Uh, in fact, I think they're very plastic. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I, th I think we're seeing an e equilibrium, essentially an equilibrium genome size in these, in these data I'm showing you. Uh, that's really, you know, the pressures of competing in that environment mean that, I mean, I mean they're dumping phosphorus acquisition genes in some parts of the ocean when you slightly raise phosphorus concentrations. They are getting rid of everything they can, and uh, their strategy for success appears to be, <coughs> you have to be careful with the term efficiency because there might be some old school microbiologists around who would correct me. In this case, this is, kind of an evolutionary efficiency. It's the efficiency with which they convert the limiting resources to more cells in kind of a neo-Darwinian sense, which is gene frequencies. We didn't talk about their size, they're teeny cells. So if we calibrate success by biomass, it changes our perspective. No more questions? Let's thank you very much, thank Steve. You.